But before we do that, we have some very special guests with us today. All the way from Rajmandri, India, <laughs> we have Pastor David and his lovely wife, Saromani. Praise God. Raju, why don't you all stand? Praise God. We want to honor you today. We love you. We appreciate you. Now, these are the missionaries that uh, we collect offering. We encourage you. We, we try to do it every month, but sometimes we just save up the money and then we send it over there. And I think we have some ready to do that. But uh, uh, we wanted to just uh, get you to see them. They pastor a wonderful church there in southern India in the city of Rajmandri. They also have been blessed by God. His son Kamal, of course, and Chelsea are spiritual sons of mine. And uh, they've built a brand new church, orphanage building, where they're housing dozens and dozens of uh, children, giving them a relationship with Jesus and the truth if they want it, a safe place to live. And, and then they have successfully built, by faith, a brand new Christian school building. And it's all built. And uh, they're believing right now to furnish that. And uh, so, uh, but we encourage our congregation, you could set aside $5, $10, $25, whatever, and just mark it sometime during the month as for India. And what we do is we separate those funds aside. A lot of you don't know that. We're, we're new, so I want to educate because you want to be a part of this. And we send that to them so that because it takes about $2,500 a month to run and fund and feed and clothe and house those orphans. And we want to be a part of that. Amen. And so what a small thing that you could do. Set aside a little bit. We really go a long way with all the other churches that are involved with their ministry. The other thing I wanted to say before we get in the Word today is they're having their annual missions banquet. Right, Brother Kamal? Uh, it's at McCracken County High School on Tuesday evening, June the 5th. June the 5th. All are welcome. But we have reserved as a church two tables of eight. Now, of course, my whole family will be there. So... Uh, that's five of the or six of the seats. And so uh, if you want to come and attend, it's free to come. It, the, you get the big presentation, Pastor David, Miss Ceremony, they'll be there. You, it'd be great for us to come out and support that event. But if you want a, a seat at our, uh, one of our two tables, let us know immediately. You could put it down on your attendance card, text the ministry, email the ministry, get with Brett myself, let us know, and we'll reserve your spot. And if we need to reserve a third table, we certainly will. Amen? But we found out they're believing for 25000 additional dollars, and what that will do is that will furnish 14, they have 14 classrooms that are going to give these kids a Christian education. They're not going to send them to the Hindu school anymore. <laughs> 14 rooms that are built, but they're not furnished. They don't have curriculum, they don't have chairs, they don't have desks, all that. So it's what? It's $1,800. That breaks down to $1,800 per classroom, and World Harvest is going to take one of those. And we already have $1,250 set aside. That's awesome. $1,250 already set aside for that. We need $550 more. So if you have it on your heart to be part of that one-time deal... You say, you sure talk a lot about offerings a lot. Well, these are opportunities to propagate the gospel. Yes. It's not about wrestling money out of anybody's hands. They're just opportunities. And uh, praise God. And so anyway, I wanted to let you know that maybe you, you can't go Tuesday night to the missions banquet, but maybe you could give $10. Maybe you could do something to help us furnish one of those classrooms. Think about the fruit for years to come and all the harvest for those that sow. That's going to go back to our heavenly account. Amen. Amen. But that's not the real motivation, is it? The real motivation is the fruit in those precious children's lives uh, that Jesus loves and die for. And we honor you guys. I didn't know you were going to be here today, but I'm so glad to see your faces. We love you very much. You, you did. Well, we're so glad you did. Thank you so very much. I'm very honored. Uh, you know, I thought I'm going to go to India and help them with some things on faith. And I don't know, maybe I did, but I, you know what I found out? This couple, they didn't need me to teach them anything about faith. I mean, praise God, he's, he's declared things in faith with a knife to his throat before. I'm telling you, he knows something about faith. Praise God, we can learn something from him. Anyway, praise God. So, praise God, we love you. We're glad to have you here today. 
Well, Hebrews chapter four, did you find it? Glory to God. Feel like a little bit what Dr. Dufresne must have felt like that time he uh, was getting ready to preach at a conference and someone came in and said, well, all the heavy guys are out there. He said, what do you mean? Well, he said, Dad Hagen's out there with mom and the Copelands are out there and the, uh, the Robertses are out there. And he's like, oh, Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But uh, it's an honor every time to stand before the apple of God's eye. Amen. That's you. And to teach and to preach to a blood-bought people. And so praise God. Hebrews chapter 4. What I have in my heart is to continue to minister uh, along the line of what we talked about last week. <clears throat> so maybe it's turning into a series. We'll just see. And we talked last week about the power of God's Word. The power of God's Word. And we took this as a text. Let's use it again. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Here the writer says, for the word of God is quick. Other translations would say alive or a living thing. I like that as a translation. That's what it means, the word quick. For the word of God is a living thing and what? All right, y'all going to have to do better. It's powerful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Ken. It's powerful. Listen, we need to just not get that as information. We need a revelation where it lights up our spirit that we gain a real understanding that the Word of God is a living thing. It is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating or piercing even to the dividing asunder. That word dividing asunder uh, means to draw a line of distinction between soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and of the thoughts, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. You know, you and I as individuals, we are not wise enough to even diagnose for ourselves the condition of our own heart. We don't have the capacity to say, my heart is perfect. My heart is right. But what we can do is we can have the, the Word of God as we expose our soul, as we expose our spirit to the Word of God, we're exposing our spirit to a living thing, a powerful thing, right. and it is going to show us Amen. where our heart is. Uh, it's going to show out and show up right thinking and wrong thinking, right believing and wrong believing. You know, let me just tell on myself, as I was coming up uh, in the things of God, I just, I'm so grateful for it. I, I just, uh, when I left that frat party, having made that deal with God, I just, God just supernaturally gave me an insatiable thirst for the Word of God. You know, the Bible calls the Word food, but it also calls it drink, right? It also, the Bible says that we should desire, Peter said, the sincere milk of the Word of God that we might grow thereby. And I just was, uh, just had this thirst for the Word, this thirst for the Word. And as I got in it, I was confronted, not in a bad way, in a good way, with, with things that I, I wasn't thinking right. So for instance, I used to, uh, I used to really enjoy horror movies. And now I'm horrified that I used to enjoy horror movies. I mean, the scarier, the darker, the the, the, the better. You know? And I thought nothing. Yeah, if you're asleep, I'm going to wake you up. I thought nothing about celebrating All Hallows Eve and dressing up like a ghoul or a demon or a gargoyle. I didn't think there's any, I just thought it was natural costume, fun. But see, as I read the living word, light came. You know, you read scripts like Paul said, I would not uh, have you to eat at the table of demons. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, the word would just show out all kinds of wrong thinking in my life. I'm not the only one. You know, I, I began to see uh, and to get some light as I read my Bible that I didn't have to be sick. Right, right. And it was just such a thrilling, 
it still is to me, a thrilling, thrilling, thrilling truth. Because I, as a kid, watched my granddaddies waste away with cancer, screaming, dying. Uh, my mom, my mom number two, Peggy, my stepmom, her sister died a horrible death. Uh, and to get the light on God's Word that it didn't have to be that way. And yet, so even as I began to accept that, you know, I had this thinking. I had this thinking, well, that's true up to a point, but eventually sickness is going to have to take me out. Otherwise, I'd live forever. you got to die of something. That's the way I thought. Wouldn't that be a natural way to think? It's a natural way to think, but it's not a Bible way to think. But see, as I continued to expose my heart to the Logos of God, I began to see people leave their body without sickness and disease. Over and over. Even under the Old uh, Covenant, where Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, God just simply said, it's time, Moses, go up on the mountain and die. You ever thought, has sat there and thought for 30 seconds about how's that work? I said, Brother Jerry, it's time. Go into your bedroom and die. Okay, what's that? What do I do? How's that work? By hook or crook? By shot? By shotgun? By overdose? How's that work? No, that's not what he means at all. He just means, the Bible would use the phrase, gave up the ghost. That he would just, that what it means, they, and that's what it says about Jesus. That at the end, when he cried out, it is finished, he gave up the ghost. He, he, his spirit left his body. The real him just left. And see, but uh, you get what I'm saying. I'm saying you see here, the word of God is so powerful. And if you'll let it, it will shine the light on wrong thinking and wrong believing. And what our attitude, our attitude towards the word is going to determine whether we make it or not. Because if we're proud and stubborn and pig-headed, and we're, we're, not gonna try, we're not going to submit old thought patterns, old ideas, old values, old beliefs to the written Word, we're not going to make it. Because the Bible says that how can, he, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? How am I supposed to walk hand in hand with God if I don't agree with what He said? See, a lot of, on God's side, He's saying by His stripes... Uh, I'm healed, and a lot of Christians are saying, no, I'm not. You're trying to teach me something. See, there's no agreement there. That's why we're not walking together in that. We have to set our heart and our mind in agreement with God. In agreement with... You. Let me say it this way. The Word is your help, and the Word is your answer. And many Christians are taking sides against the Word. As odd as that sounds. They're actually taking sides against their answer. When you say healing passed away with the last apostle, what I would want to say to you is give me two or preferably three scriptures in the New Testament in context to prove that. Otherwise, be quiet. Because you're saying something that's not true. No, no, that prosperity business, that's not right. No, that, no God doesn't want us to have anything. Money's evil. Money's the root of all evil. Didn't you know that? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money. And there's a lot of people who don't have two nickels to rub together that are committing that sin. They really love money. No, but see, we've got, to, we, we've got to stop taking sides against the Word. It's amazing to me to think that people think that they could get help from God while taking sides against His own Word. That's not going to work. You know, David said in Psalm 119, around the 89th verse, he said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God's word is established and it's settled. There's no new addition coming. Like the science textbooks. They'll be completely different next year. Because they're correcting stuff they taught as fact last year. Amen. What the thing is, is we've got to let the Word of God, let that be, it's the Word of God, and I'm settling it with me. Yeah. Come on. Brother Hagin wrote in his Bible, he said, I think he said he got it from Wigglesworth. The Word of God says it. I believe it. That settles it. 
Isn't that good sense? That's good thinking. The Word of, right? See, this was my whole thing. This set the entire course of my adult life. This question, did God write the Bible? Did God write the Bible? Here, even as a, a dumb college kid, I'm not saying all college kids are dumb, I'm saying I was. <laughs> all right? This was my thinking. If God wrote the Bible, I would be a fool not to believe every word Amen. and to do everything it said. Right. Amen. If God wrote the Bible. Right. That's, that's this side of it. Now on this side of it, my thought was, if God did not write the Bible, if man wrote the Bible, I'm going to throw it away and go back to drinking beer. Right. Because just like Paul said in the Bible, if none of this is true, preachers are of all men the most pitiable, feel sorry for them. And then we ought to just go eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. We die like a dog. So you know what I did my own study. I actually was trying to undo it. Find a contradiction. You know, the more I studied, the more I dug, the more I read, the more I studied, the more I peeled back layers, the more convinced I became. Man could not have written the Bible. And even if he could have, he wouldn't have. Man, even if he could have, he would not have written what's here. I'll give you a great example for the men. In 1 Corinthians 7, there's a scripture that says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. No man would have written that. <laughs> Isn't that right? Man would not have said, give the first, the best, and the highest 10% of your income away. No man would have written that. Man did not write the Bible. He could not have written the Bible. And even if he did, he wouldn't have written much of what's there. <laughs> Only God. So listen, every person that wants to take sides against what's written, I'm going to say it's sweet, but I'm not sorry, is a fool. <laughs> yeah. Because you're not wiser than God. It's like Pastor John Osteen. He's been in heaven many years now, but he, he used to say, I, I got a real revelation one day. And I mean, I, you're going to laugh, but it, I mean, to me, it was a revelation from God. And that revelation was God is smarter than I am. And we go done, we laugh, but people live their life practically day to day as if they're smarter than God. I don't need a pastor. I can be a great Christian without a pastor. You're smarter than Jesus. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Because Jesus said he gave gifts unto men. And one of those gifts is a pastor. I know we do things ignorantly, but ignorance is a dangerous thing. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. I'm trying to gauge how much should I meddle here? How deep of a hole do I want to climb off into? I'm going to vote for being sweet, okay? It's a holiday weekend. I'm going to stay out of trouble. Praise God. Go over with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. <laughs> oh, I just almost cannot resist. <laughs> Go for it. I wanted to pick on the Pope again. I know people are saying, oh, now be quiet. <laughs> you know, he told, a, he told a homosexual guy, hey, don't worry about it. God made you that way. He loves you just like you are. That's his latest wave that came out this week. Listen, that is in direct contradiction to what is plainly written in Old and New Testament. And he did not help that precious man at all. He hurt him in a really bad way. Hurt him in a really bad way. And hurt many who are caught up that God loves, that Jesus died for. And now have more ammo, they think, in their argument to keep living a lifestyle that will send them to hell. 
Listen, we have got to be people of the Word. I don't care who they are. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what their status is. I don't care what kind of standing they have with the world. If they're going to run crosswise of the Word... That's why I don't watch Christian TV. I just can't. I just, I'm sorry, I just can't. I just can't do it. Huh. Don't ask me to do it. <laughs> People do good for a little bit and then they tear it up. Oh, anyway. Praise God. All right, you asked for it. First Peter chapter 1. Look at something. We're, read, we're talking about uh, the Word of God, the power in God's Word. Chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 23. Peter says this, Being born again, not of corruptible or perishable seed, but of what kind of seed? Incorruptible or imperishable, by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Hallelujah. I want you to notice here that the Word of God is called a seed. Amen. The Word of God is called a seed. Therefore, the Word of God, this powerful Word, how do we benefit from it? We have to work it like a farmer works a seed. You see, there are many Christians trying to get harvest from God without planting the seed. They're trying to get the harvest of the baptism with the Holy Ghost without planting the seed. They're trying to get a harvest of finances apart from God apart from planting the seed. Many Christians, they're trying to get healing for their body from God, but apart from planting the seed. The Word of God is an imperishable, incorruptible seed. It is a living thing. It is powerful. It will accomplish everything God sent that Word to do. But it is powerless, unsown. It is powerless if you leave it ink on a page in your car. It is powerless if you leave it ink on a page on your coffee table or in digital format on your phone. You've got to work the Word like a farmer works the seed. All seed is powerless until and unless it is planted. Weeks ago, weeks ago, uh, I have a dog. I have more than one, but I, I have one that is especially trying. We have a love irritation type of relationship. And it's mainly she loves me and I'm irritated with her. My little black Gracie. And she's really too smart for her own good, but she's got a lot of, she's all dog, but really smart. And she knows there's something under the ground. She wants it. And she has turned my front yard into a moonscape. <laughs> Literally. Literally. And so I, uh, you know, uh, wanted to get all that smoothed out, but in anticipation of getting that ground smoothed out, I bought a big bag of Kentucky fescue full of seed. And it's been sitting in my garage for weeks. Weeks. Now, I sit on my front porch this time of year for devotional in my morning time. Amber and I drink coffee, read the Bible, talk, pray, get the day going. And uh, I look out, and you know what I don't see? I do not see the manifestation of Kentucky Fescue Lawn. I see a moonscape with weeds. Well... And it don't, I, I, the other day I was sitting there and I, I, I saw the, the rain clouds coming in and I had this revelation. I'm never going to have grass if I don't plant the seed. So the other day I loaded it up and with the rain coming down, I'm getting the seed out. Why? That seed has all the power and all the potential to create a lawn in my front yard but not in that sack in my shop. All, think about all the Scriptures on healing. 
who in His own body bear our sin in His on the tree, that we being dead unto sins might live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. That is a seed. That is a seed. The Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 20, God sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Matthew 8, 17, that He Himself bore our sicknesses, our infirmities. Right? Matthew 8, 17 tells us that. Hallelujah. That is a seed. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. It is a seed. The Word of God is a seed. And remember, now let's talk about the healing of your body. That Word on healing is alive. It's alive. Frankenstein, it's alive, it's alive. (laughs) It's alive. And it's powerful. Right? But right, we've got... got, High quality vitamin and mineral in our refrigerator, in our cabinet. Does this no good? Does this no good where it's at? Right, right. You got to take it up, you got to mix it up, you got to get it in you. Mm-hmm. That's when it works. Mm-hmm. See, people are wanting to just come to church and thank God for the different ways that God ministers healing to people. But you know, listen, Brother Hagen pastored for 12 years and he said, It was very rare occurrence, if ever, if any of my church members ever received healing in my church through the gifts of healings. Why? Because God, those church members have been taught. And He expects them. What did He expect them to do? Go home and plant the seed. Go home and plant the seed. But now today, we've had such ministry of healing live before us, It's almost the only way people want to get it is in a prayer line. I'm not trying to not get you to come into my prayer line. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying many people don't have the healing that they could have because they refuse to go home and put the seed of the healing word into the soil of their heart. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Preaching good. Teaching good. But see, when you get this revelation, listen. (laughs) There is nothing that you can't overcome. Nothing. There is absolutely no sickness. There is no addiction. There is no habit. There is no chain. There's no bond. There's no financial circumstance. There's no demonic attack that the Word of God won't hold up against. Remember, it's not just a seed. Last week I taught it to you as what? A sword. And that we ought to not just read it, we ought to wield it. Hallelujah. Well, praise God, we we want to get the whole picture of what the Bible says about the Word. We don't want to just wield it as a sword. It says plant it like a seed. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 5 says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers? Right? So he's saying, look, all I am and all Apollos is, is a sower. I'm going to show you this. We're just here to sow God's Word. That's all we are. He said, really, he's trying to get them, don't think of us beyond what you ought to think. Right? Because they had divided themselves up into camps according to who the minister they liked the most. They were, they were, the Corinthians were saying, I, I'm of Paul. Paul's my guy. And others would say, no, I, I'm not of Paul. I'm of Apollos. And Paul is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's all bohunkus. That's all wrong thinking. That's right. You know, some of you, you're less likely to come to church if you think my wife's preaching. So you're not thinking right. That's right. Or maybe you're not likely to come to church unless she's preaching. (laughs) You know, uh, Dr. Dufresne for years, they they pastored a church, you know, together for about, sorry, about 25 years. My my batteries are declining now. And um, 
And so uh, people would call. Is doctor preaching? Is Pastor Nancy preaching? They had Pastor Nancy people, and they had Dr. Dufresne people, and then they had Morgan people, and then they had Stephen people. Listen, that's not the right way to think about that. The right way to think about it is, it's an anointed vessel through which the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father are going to sow the Word of God into the soil of my heart, and that's what I'm coming for. I don't care if it's a female vessel or a male vessel, if it's Pastor Amber or Pastor Chris or Brother Brett or Sister Marilyn, as long as it's the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, I'm good. Because it's not the vessel through which the Word, no, it's the Word. It's the Word that's going to change your life. See la. You know, David said, think about that. Well, I changed this battery. Praise God. We should be good. All right. See, the Bible will show up this wrong thinking. It's just immature thinking. Right? I've had people and they've told me, I said, are you coming to the, you know, Dr. Jacobs is coming. Are you coming? He said, no, you know what? I, I, love, I love all these other ministers, but you know what? I'm just really a Pastor Chris guy. You know, and he's saying that to me, and he's meaning to be complimentary. But it's wrong thinking. I didn't receive it as a compliment. What I received it as, you're showing me how unbiblically you're thinking. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, moving on. Look at verse number uh, five again. It says, But we are ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now, notice what Paul says. I. As a minister, what did he do? I have planted and Apollos watered, but God, a little bit of an echo, David, God gave the increase. The increase to what? To what was planted and what was watered. God doesn't give the increase to a minister. He increases the Word that's sown, planted, and watered in our hearts. That's what he gives increase to. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 7. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one. And every man or person shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Amen. Hallelujah. For you are laborers together with God. Now notice this. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. The Moffat's translation says, you are God's not husbandry, you are God's cultivated ground. Other translations would say, you are God's garden to be planted. See, this is how God sees you in one respect. He sees you as dirt. <laughs> Don't, not in a derogatory way. What, why does, he sees this not only as dirt, but cultivated ground. We are cultivated ground. What for? Why do you cultivate ground? To plant something. See, God has created us to be cult, the cultivated ground that the Word goes in. And that is how God's, all of God's wonderful harvests that He has for us in life, come into being. Amen. See, some of you, you don't like yourself. You have a very poor self-image. Well, you don't need a better self-image. You need to see who you are in Christ. Amen. You need to see yourself not like the best you, 
But you need to see yourself as you truly are in Him. Amen. Amen. How does that work? You plant that in you. Over 133 scriptures in the New Testament letters, the New Testament epistles, that use the phrase in Christ or in Him or in whom. Right? Colossians says, I am complete in Him. Right? So that movie had it wrong. Amber does not complete me. Jesus does. And as a complete person, I'm a better husband. And we could flow together in life, flow together as a dream team. Right? But I'm not a half of me. I'm, I'm in Christ. The Bible says that he who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I'm not some dirty, rotten sinner. The Bible calls me the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's what you are if you're born again. That's how you need to see yourself. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm right with God. Woo, thank you. It'll change the way you approach Him. Oh, Father, I'm such, I know I'm so unworthy. Oh, but I need to beg of you, please do me this one little thing. No, you walk in there with honor and you walk in there in reverence and say, Father, I'm coming into your presence, blood bought, redeemed. I thank you that I am the righteousness of God and I've come here to lay claim to my inheritance. Amen. You know, God likes that. Amen. Because someone's coming to him that's finally got a little bit of a clue about what he did for them. Don't you like that scripture? The one who knew no sin was made to be sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. But you know, there's another verse that's very similar in pattern of structure. It says this, that though he were so very rich, yet he became poor, that through his poverty, ye might be made rich. How come you don't get the same reaction? Because in our minds, we've been trained to think there's something wrong with rich. All that word means is a full supply. So he, though he was, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8 or 9, though he was so very rich, yet he became poor, that you and I, through his poverty, might have a full supply. Now, you need to, if you're not thinking this way and talking this way, you need to catch up with me. This is the way I've been living for many years. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, but I'm also rich in Him. I have a full supply for my life, for my children, for my family, for my ministry. Hallelujah. Do you know that He was made sick? That through His sickness you might be healed? He suffered for us, spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. What I wanted you to see, though, here in this verse, is do you see the word is a seed and your heart is the field? Your word is... Go over to Mark chapter 4. Oh, Jesus, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What area of your life do you need a harvest in? Right? People want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, speak with other tongues. Well, have you heard the word on it? You see, people want, don't you want to be a giant in faith? You know you can be. You can be a giant of faith. If you'll Learn this one verse, Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Right? You're building faith. Many people, they listen to, oh, that's, you know, sad old honky-tonk music. And that's what they hear. And my sweetheart left me and my dog died and no, 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 no. I got friends in low places. 
You know you're building faith in that? That's what you're building faith in. Whatever you're hearing in abundance, you're developing faith in your heart because faith comes by hearing. You, people, people have told me in tears, Pastor, I know I'm not going to be healed. I just don't have the faith you have. But you know what? That's not true. The very same measure and the very same quality of faith that I got when I was born again, God gave you. The only difference is the amount of time and what I have done to develop my faith by hearing it and 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 hearing it again. That's the only difference. <laughs> Hallelujah. You could change any circumstance. How did David, a teenager, become a giant killer? Well, you can read about his attitude towards the Word. It'll take you a little while to do it. I did it yesterday. Read Psalm 119. It's got 170-something verses in that one psalm. And every verse has something to do with the Word. Every. You can see, he just meditated in it. And he meditated in it. Out there watching those sheep. you got a lot of time on your hands. You know, he didn't have a cell phone with apps. So he had his Old Testament. And he fed on it, and he fed on it, and he fed on it, and he sang about it, and he thought about it, and he worshipped God to it. Amen. And a lion showed up, and the bigness of God's Word got in him. And the Bible says he grabbed that lion by the beard. Right. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> right? You ever been to a zoo where they had a, a close-up encounter with the lion? Like we did that with the aquarium in Cincinnati, and those sharks were in there. I'm glad how thick is its glass. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but David took the lion by the beard and slew him. That's right. Amen. I might have said, you can have that sheep. I didn't like him anyway. <laughs> he grabbed the lion by the beard. That's right. He slew the bear. Yeah. And all that time he's out there in the field getting big, getting big on the word. The word getting big in him. And when he saw that giant, he just said, Man, I've, done, I've been here, done that with the lion and with the bear. And praise God, he's going down. Just give me a shot at him. Any person that gets big on the Word is going to become a giant in faith. You don't have to be weak in faith. You don't have to pray prayers that go unanswered. Hallelujah. Mark 4, verse 14. Notice it says, the sower, what does he do? The sower sows the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, notice this, Satan comes immediately. What's he after? He wants that word. He wants that word. Satan will fight you coming and connecting to a church that's preaching the word. He, he, he understands how powerful the word is. He understands the life-transforming ability of God's Word. He knows what's going to happen when a generation of people gets caught up with the Word more than they are their computer and their iPad and their app, and they're caught up with the Word and they've sown it in their heart and they flat become a giant in faith with it. He's scared of them. He wants the Word. He tries to take it out of their heart. Then Jesus said, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. See, He's describing the place and the condition that the Word is falling on, the ground, the soil. This is stony ground. And when these people heard the Word, they immediately receive it with gladness. They shout yes and amen. They wave their hanky. But they have no root in themselves. And so they endure only but a time. But when pressure comes, when uh, afterwards it says when affliction or persecution arises. Now why does that come? It says right here it's for the Word's sake. For the word's sake, immediately they are offended. See, here's what happens in our church. Just give you a clue. I preach the word. Right? And I, whether or not you stay in sticks is going to tell me what kind of dirt you are. Because a lot of people I go to preach and they get offended. Well, Jesus talked about it. Right? Yeah, 
And this is why, you know, they may get excited for a minute and then all Satan does is puts a little resistance on them. A little financial pressure. A little this, a little that. And they, they throw in the towel. Why? Because the Word has to, it hasn't, it's a seed. You have to get that thing to take root. You have to nurture that seed. You have to watch that seed. You have to water that seed. And it says uh, that, uh, you know, that they are offended for the Word's sake. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the Word. Now notice this and judge yourself. I'll judge myself. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts or the desires of other things entering in choke the Word and it becomes unfruitful. You see, the Word's got to find a proper place in your heart. And it's as simple. Why so many Christians are defeated today, it's, it's as simple as they are too busy. They're too busy. They're too distracted. They're chasing after money. Isn't that what it says? The deceitfulness of rich. I come to church today? No, I'm taking an extra shift. You're going to pay a price for that. If you're choosing that, you know, I understand people have to work, whatever. Amen. But we need to prize the place that God has assigned for us to come and have the Word sown in us. We need to prize that place and protect that place. Right? But it's not just about coming to church. What about your devotional life? Are you in the Word every day? Amen. Are you in the Word enough? Yeah. Hallelujah. Or are things entering... Notice things entered in. He described three... They entered in. I always get people on this question. I don't want you to be God. I'll ask people the question, is there any... I'll get them all ramped up, you know. Is there anything more powerful than the Word of God? And people will shout, no. And I'll go, you're wrong. And they look at me like I spoke a, a, heres, a heresy. But notice right here, as powerful the word is, other things can enter in and choke it out. Things enter into the mind and chokes out your meditation. You're distracted. The devil, he couldn't defeat you by getting you in sin, but he's rendered you powerless through busyness and unfruitful activity. Praise the Lord. So, because of this, these things enter in and they become, notice this, unfruitful. Now verse 20 says, And these are they which are sown on good ground. Everyone say good ground. These are people that hear the Word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. So we'll have to close here. We don't want to keep you unduly today. But uh, you can see here that Jesus describes four kinds of dirt, doesn't He? Four types of soil that describe the human heart. Notice here, 75% of humanity don't do anything with the seed. Only 25% do anything with the Word of God. And even them, they don't produce equal fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Now I want to leave you with a revelation here. I want you to think about this. Much of the modern church out there are going after and they're ministering to this 75%. That's why they give them so little word because they become offended if you give them the word. That's why they give 15 minute downloadable sermonettes based on Hollywood movies. They're making it fleshly and comfortable and watered down because they are catering to the 75% who aren't going to do anything with the Bible, with the Word. Listen, each and every one of us as we close today, we decide which category we fall in. But Amber and I, and this is not a new thing, before we ever preached our first sermon, 
Amen. I preached my first sermon, November 18th. The spirit of faith. That's what I preached on. Hallelujah. We need to pull that out. Listen to it. I bet I sound different. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. We made that decision before we showed up here 17 years ago. We are going to preach the word. We are going to sow the word. And we are going to build a church on the 25%. We are believing that God will draw people who will do something with the Word. That's why so many, they come, they stay a few weeks, they don't make it. It's because they got, they got issues with their soil. <laughs> and we love them, but they need to go home and uproot some thorns. And get some rocks out of the way. And they need, to t- they need to till up some ground. So that if, if they'd ever come back in, there's some room in their heart for the Word to take hold and to sprout and to grow and to germinate. Another thing I would appeal to you as part of my closing is, if you're new, stay around a while. Don't let a, a, a nice... You know... When, you, when, you, when the seed of the Word of God, a living, powerful thing, drops, it'll, you'll know it will be different. Yeah. Oh, that's different. I don't know about all that. Well, listen, is it the Bible? Is it the Word? If it's the Word, you need it. It'll do you good. And don't let that get away from you. Right? Don't let Satan... Uh, Keep you away through busyness and distractions. Hallelujah. You and I decide. Amen. You know, Dad Dufresne, in 1999, he said he had an experience with God. He stepped on an elevator to go upstairs to, after a service to preach. And all of a sudden, he felt his spirit start coming out of his body. Last thing he said that he could hear uh, in his body was, Jesus, I don't know if I can go that far, you know, in an experience. And before then, he said, next thing I knew, I was at the throne. All I could see was that glass and feet. I wasn't allowed to see anything else, but then I heard words, and Jesus talked to me about the last days and a false flesh. He called, Jesus called it the flesh church. This is 1999, that a flesh church would rise up alongside the true church, a false church. I write about it in my book out there. The, the black one on overcoming last day's deception. And Jesus said to, to Dad Dufresne, He said, tell my ministers not to be discouraged because this flesh church is going to be a lot bigger for a while in numbers. Well, think about it. 75% versus 25%. He said, tell my ministers not to be discouraged but to keep preaching the Word. Just keep preaching the Word. He said, because I'm not going to put my fruit, my harvest in those barns. If I did, I'd lose my fruit. I'm going to put my end time harvest in barns. He called churches barns that are preaching the Word. Amen. And I mean, we're we're in it deeper. I believe you are drawn here because He sees you as harvest and precious fruit. He doesn't want to lose you. And He knows you and I, we need the Word. Amen. 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 Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we just so thank You for highlighting again to us, giving us good utterance, uh, refreshing 